Hi everyone, and welcome to today's Tech Talk. This is gonna be slightly different because we're gonna be having a look about the project overview. We're gonna to be seeing about decisions we made three, four months ago when we first decided on this project. How have we ended up where we are today with the setup we've got and try and explain some of the decisions that we took to get there. Because I'm sure these are decisions that you're all trying to make every day and wonder about the pros and cons of some of those ones. So do you want to head us off with the tools and then I'll get into the setup later? Yeah, uh, so obviously we've picked our tools uh, and we've always got to start somewhere. And probably with this material, that's where we start. You know, we're machining titanium, that's going to be the first stage of us looking at and, and making our decisions when it comes to tool selection. Yeah. You know, we'll find as we go into the uh, different aspects of this project and go through all the different tools, there's one thing that we've got in common and that's dedicated grades or geometries for this kind of material. You know, we know titanium or can be a difficult material to machine. Uh, for a number of reasons, uh, but one of them, or the main one, is this heat generation that we see uh, within the machining process. So, you know, we've got to take that in into account when it comes to the selection of our tools. Yeah, because it's quite an interesting part, you know, it's, we designed this part because we wanted something that was sort of representative of what a lot of both of our customers are doing. You know, so it starts off as 67 kilos of titanium. It's a big lump. Um, and we take that down to, I think it's like 10.2 it finishes out. So we knew there's going to be a lot of roughing on this part. And then, unfortunately, I say, because we've got some really nasty surfaces as well that we have to try and finish around. So we've got a, a big selection there. Um, I decided it'd be a good idea to put some threads in this part, uh, which then brought in a completely new element of tapping or thread milling. And then we've got the tools to suit there as well. So it was a nice overview on a couple of different processes that a lot of people have to do in their day-to-day -day working. Yeah, definitely. Because once we've looked at the material, we've kind of decided on the grade, we need to take all those different elements into account and try and understand how we get the best out of the tools and the strategy to produce this component. Yeah, definitely. Because I think if we look at that part and in, let's say the internal pockets, for example, there's a lot of different geometries there. So I suppose the ideal thing would be a different tool for every different geometry of pocket, but that's not always available. No, definitely you know, well, not. not available, not always efficient. So I suppose you have the available tooling, but it's not efficient to have 10 M mills for one job. We want to utilize the, the products in the best way we can and do as many features as possible all at once. Yeah, definitely. So the, that, that's all where we come to where we've got, you know, they've got the, the five times D and then down to the two times D. So we've got that nice spread across the part. Brilliant. So how, how are we holding these tools? Why is it special and why is it necessary? Yeah, so that's another consideration. You know, as we look at it, you know, for us, our first choice is our hydraulic chucks. You know, we're looking here with the, the Coro Chuck 930. Uh, so, you know, this is a, a hydraulic truck with fulcrum technology that we have uh, available to us. And, you know, that helps to try and get zero pull out uh, on our uh, end mills. We also have a series of collets that help with that zero pull out. We do have a mechanical locking collet that's available to us. So we've got different elements to consider because you know if this was a real part and we had pull out, then we'd be looking at a scrap component. Yeah. So we've got to be mindful of these considerations when we're looking at these kind of projects. Yeah. I suppose spinning the tool clockwise and then the flutes mean it's constantly trying to be pulled out of that, yeah, that it's collet. Like a corkscrew effect as yeah. many call it so you know we have to be mindful of that with these kind of operations okay that is really interesting and then i know we've got sort of two different size holders so i'm guessing that's trying to balance rigidity versus collisions yeah absolutely you know with the range of, of chucks that we have with the 930 you know we have the heavy duty ones that we use but we also have you know down to pencil chucks oh, wow. long extensions so you know, there's different elements that we have to take into account that you know maybe this time we've been quite lucky with a lot of shorter uh, chucks but you know sometimes we have to have some really big ones as well so we have to utilize the pencil chucks within that range yeah definitely so the machine we've got uh, we've got our, our homely it has got through spindle coolum because back when we were discussing this project um, we've got a few different machines here in the tech center we were going to use a machine without through spindle and you were very very keen on us to not use that machine because of you know the limitations it would have given us we'd have had to have really have dialed back 
on some of the cutting parameters and potentially even have to look at changing the strategies? Yeah, I mean, the more coolant we have with this kind of material, the better. You know, it's all about cooling the tool. And the advantages are through coolant when we're looking at certainly drilling products. You know, we're making sure we get that coolant to the tip of the cutting edge, uh, but also with our milling products as well, and ensuring that we're getting the chips away from the cutting surface, away from the cutting edge, and we aren't recutting those uh, chips. Certainly when we're looking at pocketing, you know, we need to have that good chip evacuation and, and get everything out of the way. Yeah, because I suppose, you know, if these, if these drills are sort of already down into a hole, you're just cooling the top and that's not doing the cutting. No, exactly. You know, down at the cutting edge is where we need it with drilling because, you know, there's nowhere else for those chips to go, you know, and not only for the, the cooling chip evacuation, you know, it's a really good element and an important element of the drilling process. Yeah, definitely. We don't want to get a, a broken carbide bit in the drill. You're never going to get that out again. Oh, no, we're going to struggle. So we've got our HSK100 spindle, mm -hmm. and then we've got a C6 adapter. Yep, so we're utilizing a Coromant Captor uh, adapter for this, uh, which we have a, a number of back ends uh, when it comes to our 930 range. But in this example, we've got that face and taper contact with the Coromant Captor interface. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. So we sort of know what tooling we've got. We know why we've chosen the machine. It's got the, the correct power spindle we're after. It's got the three stall coolant. Um, so I think a little bit on our setup of, of the part on the table, really. So um, we've got a, a base plate with riser blocks because we were very concerned, you know, we're going to be having to do some um, collision avoidance on this part because, you know, we're going to have large walls we have to get around. So we have to tilt the head or the table in this case, trying to get around those. So the riser blocks just mean that part sits a bit higher on the table and just gives a bit more flexibility around means that we're not going to be worrying and trying to peer through the glass every time we go on an angle, that we're not going to hit the table and the spindle together. We've then got two crimping vices. So we crimp the material beforehand and then the vices grip onto those crimps because it's really important to hold the part rigid, isn't it? Because if we've got any vibration in that part, it's going to soon show on the tools. Yeah, workpiece stability is just as important as the tool instability as well. You know, we need to make sure we've got a rigid setup so that we can get the best out of the tools because any vibration from the material is going to affect any surface finishes that we're trying to achieve. And also it's going to affect any stable processes that we're wanting to have with this. Yeah, definitely. And sort of on that note as well, we've managed to split this part into two operations. So we've got an, an op, op 10, as I would call it, where we've got the part upside down, really, and we're doing all of the heavy work. So that was sort of the decision we went to was where's most of the material got to come out of? and then make sure you've got the most rigid work holding possible then to get all that metal removed. Definitely. We've got to analyze which features we do first. We want to have the most stable process. So, you know, like we said, getting rid of that material is the first operation. We've got the, the stock to grip on. It gives us a much stable process for the machining. Yeah, that's really interesting to think about. We've got a fix then, so we flip it over on our machine. We remove the vices and we put a, a bespoke fixture on and we bolt it down then. It's quite nice that we have the bolt holes in the part. Sometimes you might have to make some diff difficult decisions on your component. You might have to have more than two setups. You might have to have multiple setups, but it's all about trying to make sure it's rigid. You know, of course, the fewer the better, but I'd rather have more setups and a more rigid setup than try and skimp on the number of setups and end up potentially having a part fly out the vise or just general vibrations that will show then into the tools. Any instability is always going to cause us a problem without a doubt. Yeah, that's really interesting. Well, that covers a lot of decisions we made, but even, even back in the beginnings, so we had to make some compromises on this project. So we couldn't do it in the most optimum way possible. Absolutely. So as that's our project overview coming to a close, it's a brilliant place to talk about the upcoming episodes in these series. So first of all, we're going to be taking a look at high feed side milling and Fusion 360's adaptive roughing strategies. We're going to be showing you why it's a much more efficient process, you know, how using that full flute engagement really makes you be able to attack the material in a more efficient way. We're going to be looking at drilling and, and, and threading and why would I thread mill over tapping and should I peck drill or should I go, go straight and do a deep drilling method? And then finally, we look at how we finish this part and give you some real top tips on never cutting on the center of the ball and how do you actually do that then inside of the software. So please stay tuned 
And don't forget, any of the information that you see in these videos can all be found in the links below. So with that, thanks again for watching and please tune in again next time.